look, I'm What is the purpose for that? Hey, none of your business. You just, you people just are so arrogant, so proud, and so foolish. Why don't you learn the everlasting gospel? Why don't you believe Revelation 14? Why don't you fear God and give Him glory? The focus from the very beginning was what can we do to end this thing peacefully? And of course, the main focus was on the children. Let's send them out of that house right now. No. We learned pretty quickly that there was only one decision maker inside. There was no consensus. There was no management team. What I'd like is for you to uh, send a couple of children out uh, before it gets... I don't, it's not possible. He just, I just asked him. He said no. Okay. David Koresh was the absolute leader inside, and his word was final. David agreed to send them out two by two if we would read a specific scripture that he gave over the radio. My name is Dave Koresh. I'm speaking to you from Mount Carmel Center. We got six children out the first day. He says he will release more children two by two. He knew that those children would appeal to the public. A total of 10 children have been released from the compound. He wanted the public to think that if they died, they died at the hands of law enforcement. But still there has been no surrender. Caring for our children on this earth was only part of what we had to do. Saving their souls for eternity was a whole lot bigger job. Kathy and Mike Schroeder were a married couple at Mount Carmel. They had a child between the two of them, but she had three children from a previous relationship. Sunday, my husband was killed by ATF agents. I want everyone to know he was just coming home to his family. He didn't kill anybody, that's all. She was really devoted and very angry at the government, understandably so, early on. But everybody's got some vulnerability, something that may get them, that, that's stronger to them than their devotion to Koresh. And that's what we had to try to figure out. It was one thing for me to die for what I believed in, and I was ready to do that. But I wasn't real sure I was ready for, for my kids to do that. That emotional need, that psychological need, that maternal instinct overrode her devotion. As much as I believed the message, I really didn't want my kids to have to die. I knew that they could make it in this world and make it in life, even if I wasn't here. And I'd rather they have that chance to life. We had a clear sense from talking to the parents when the children would come out, that these parents love their children as anyone would love their, their children. Hi, how you doing? Fine. They treat me good? Yeah. Okay. Remember what I said. God sits on the trunk. Hi, Daddy. Hi, Heather. I love you. Hey, Mark. Huh? I love you. You be good boy, okay? Okay. But we also had a clear sense that these adults, these parents, had a significant attachment and loyalty to David Koresh. Is coming out not an option that, that you're comfortable with? Could no. you come out with some of the children yourself? Yes, thank you very much. I knew that my mom didn't want to be there, but I think when you're that far in and you're not given much of a choice or options to think for yourself, you do what you're told to do. She asked David if she could go, and he said, he said no, because he, he only was going to let the children out. My mother never directly told me what was going on. As soon as she found out I could be let go, she packed, you know, what little I had, and she gave me her necklace. It really is the only thing she had. She wrote a note to my sister, she said her goodbyes. The FBI confirmed that seven-year-old Joanne Vega is safe. Her stepsister Ursula told News 4 she just got the word. Yeah, I'm just glad she's out and she's safe. She, and, and if anything should go wrong, that she wouldn't be caught in the crossfire. I just saw Joanne and I picked her up and I just hugged her. And I started crying and she started crying and and I, I couldn't let go. That was like the only time I felt safe through the whole thing is when I saw my sister for the first time. 
The note that my mother had included said, by time you read this note, I'll probably be dead. Take good care of Joanne, she's yours. Love you much, Mom. 18 children have been released from the compound and 20 other children are believed to still be inside. The kids are being taken to emergency shelters that have been set up especially for them. A team of specialists is assessing each child. While we watched them, we learned a lot about the belief system of the Davidians. If you like shooting us in the head, why don't you shoot you in the head? They would have these songs they would sing. Consistent with this final apocalyptic event, younger kids would draw a picture of the compound with fire coming out of it. And I would say, what's that? And they go, that's none of your business. You'll find out. Some we continue now with Truth and Lies, Waco. There has been no break in the standoff at a fortified compound near Waco, Texas. The leader of a religious cult and other armed members of his group remain inside the compound. They are surrounded by hundreds of police and federal agents now. Discussions continued over the telephone and... Uh... In the first few days of the siege, as the nation turned its attention to Mount Carmel, everybody was wondering, what's going on in there? How many are there? How many children? How are they living? They had stockpiled enormous amounts of food. I was like, wow, they really were expecting something to happen because they were ready. The food was rationed, the water was rationed. We were lucky if we got eight ounces a day. You had to have your bath and clean your teeth. There would be two MREs, military meals ready to eat for every individual a day. That was not pleasant. Potatoes are rotten. We used to call them potatoes are rotten. What they least understood is the fact that the people inside there weren't a bunch of bank robbers. We weren't a bunch of terrorists, we weren't a bunch of criminals. We were a community of people living together. What can we do right this minute to get things moving so we can get this thing maybe resolved today? Well, you can tell these agents that as an American citizen, somebody has stepped on my property and there's gonna be some butt whooped over this. Either my butt or it's gonna be their butt. The average hostage barricade situation, even though this was anything but average, lasts in the neighborhood of six to eight hours. Little did I know what I was rolling into. Do you know what the name Koresh means? It means death. If you're dealing with a manipulative, egomaniacal character like David Koresh, you're in for a heck of a ride. We tried to find a lot of innovative and creative ways to establish a relationship of trust. We made a request that they prepare a videotape of the folks inside so that we could put a face to a name and get a sense of their personalities. Uh, Wanna see one of the holes here? It's kind of painful. Hey, this is my family. It may not be like your family. We were stunned when we saw all those precious little kids that were his biological children. Her name is Serenity. One of the things that was very, very clear is that these kids were afraid of David. In the way they behaved, the way they complied, the way they interacted with him. Hey, you love me? Have a kiss? Thank you. Who's treated you good? David. When David says, hey, come here, they were robotic. Right? We got a lot of insight, the absolute unwavering commitment to David Koresh and his ministry. Don't you want to be with your children? Yes, I would much rather my children be here with me. But I would not like to be out there because I know that what I'm doing here is for a reason. Is anyone holding you here against your will, Kathy? Only God. Only God. Only God. It's his will and his will be done. That question and answer that was asked of each one. Are you here on your own free will? And they said, yes. yes. This is my home. This is my way. This is where I want to be. And David is the person who is leading us in the way that, that gives us meaning. This is where the truth is. And where else is it? This is where existence is for me in the world. I mean, there is no existence outside. I'm not being here, held here against my will. 
I came and I went as I pleased, and I've decided to stay as I please. They may have made a decision that people think is ridiculous and tragically wrong, but it was their decision. You come point guns in the, in the direction of my wives and my kids, damn it, I'll, I'll meet you at the door any time. We responded by sending in a video of the four or five of us who had spoken to him up to that point and showed him pictures of our family. I have a family too. And these other gentlemen who have talked to you, they have families. We can show you pictures. Yes, I'm an FBI agent, but I'm also a human being. I'm a father. I love my kids. And we know that that's exactly the way you feel, too. I mean, this is stuff that does not come out of the negotiation playbook. The standoff near Waco is in its fourth day today with no end in sight. The FBI says 90 adults and 20 children remain in the compound. David, how could we resolve this? I mean, how could we save these children and women and... Give me the coverage. Okay, I'm going to get your scripture message to the radio station right away. We came up with the idea of saying, well, if you'll record a message, and in that message, you promise to peacefully surrender, we did that, uh, and we were very hopeful. FBI agent John Wallace brought the tape to the station at 1 o'clock this afternoon, and it was broadcast over a religious network. We made an agreement with the ATF agents that if they would allow me to have national coverage with this tape, that all the people would give ourselves over to the world. So everybody packed bags and got ready to come out. Say see y'all soon. We were all prepared to receive them and bring them out. All of a sudden, everything went quiet. Right now, we just don't know. Despite his pledge to surrender over seven hours ago. We will keep vigil outside uh, Waco at this compound all night or forever, if that's what it takes. Back to you. We said, David, we need to get this moving. We aired that tape just like you asked us to do, and you promised to come out. That I'm willing to come out, it just lies between one thing. My God told me to wait, and that's all I'm doing. We're dumbfounded. He gave us his word. I know that. that I'm aware of that. That after the message was played. Yes, but what if there is a higher power than you and I that speaks to an individual? Be aware of who you're dealing with. Koresh reneged on it. He changed his mind. What can I say? You just um, They call me a rambling man, don't they? David was a liar. He was a deceiver, and he was masterful at it. When we finally heard that, I knew this was going to be a long-term ordeal. The FBI command took this in a very angry way. Keeping one's word does not necessarily uh, apply to Mr. Koresh. When God told him not to do something, he didn't do it. So I understood that part of it, where other people laughed at him. It sounds like he's making a fool out of himself. It escalated things to a point where, in response, the FBI advanced onto the property with its tanks. Tanks are making their way closer and closer to the Branch Davidian compound. The paradox of power is the harder you push, the more likely you are to get resistance. You want to go knuckles to knuckles now. You want to have it all out. Why are you doing this? We're talking and being rational. And now, all of a sudden, your consequences include cutting the power and having tanks come onto the property. That was a conflicting message to them. Like, you want us to come out, but now you're bringing in military tanks? This is going to be a war. I'm talking to you. Somebody's going to get hurt. When we set out to make new Banquet Mega Bowls, we didn't... On ABC. Negotiations are ongoing with David Koresh. Koresh and his followers have been barricaded inside now for 10 days. Federal agents say they are trying to maintain some sort of optimism as this ordeal trudges on. Another frustrating day for law officers. Now well into their fourth week of a standoff with cult leader David Koresh. We knew that there was something going on within the FBI. There was something going on within the teams. 
and clearly they were not on the same page. We were having a disconnect between the hostage rescue team and the negotiation teams. The tactical teams are very different. They're action-oriented, right? To a, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And they looked across that field and they saw a big one. You went back on your word. That is a lie. That is not a lie. They did so many things to try to provoke us. At night, the compound continues to be bathed with spotlights as loudspeakers blare messages. David Perez, pick up the phone. Negotiators are attempting to get a hold of you. They'd like to speak with you. Then they started playing loud music. Trumpets trumpeting, telephones ringing. They had helicopters buzzing over us, anything to keep you on edge. The FBI says it will continue to use bright lights and loud noises to try and drive the remaining cult members from the compound. Really, that's all you could think of. These were desperate measures to try to get them out. I think it was a real sign to us that their negotiations were not going well. Frankly, it was terribly embarrassing for the negotiation team. I did not agree to that. You well, agreed to Well, let's agree to, to it then. Let's agree Absolutely to it. Absolutely not. We become ever more mistrustful, obviously, of their actions. What they say and what they do are two different things. That's the main reason you never want to have your tactical people convey a different message than what the negotiators are saying. You lose credibility. It seemed to me like everything they did was a dare. It's like, OK, what are you going to do now? Come on. We want you to shoot. We want you to shoot. Up to this point, agents have stayed at least 150 yards from the Branch Davidian compound. But now, they're beginning to move in. Steve, we're patrolling these guys. I mean, if you got guys out there right now pulling their pants down, men Steve. that are mature, that are they're sticking their butts out in the air and flipping the finger. Give me, give me a moment, see. Right. The guys that gravitate toward, uh, you know, riding in tanks, jumping out of airplanes and stuff like that, are a little I, different mindset than I you and I. With you. I think Steve Schneider was probably the most important of the followers that David Koresh had. Steve was a religious theologian from Hawaii. He and his wife went to Mount Carmel to live with David Koresh. My name is um, Judy Schneider Koresh, and this is my daughter, Mina. What brought you here in the first place to Waco, Texas? To study with David. The very sad part about Steve Schneider is that he truly loved his wife, and his wife became one of David Koresh's wives. David, anything you'd like to say? When you see that videotape, the person you hear behind the camera is Steve Schneider. What about Maya? Does she want to say anything? Say hello to your grandma? Steve and his wife were trying to have a baby, but she got impregnated by David Koresh. And that broke Steve's heart. And the FBI was trying to use that to get him to turn on David Koresh. They've got a picture over here that shows you with Judy. She's a very attractive lady. This is true. She is. Do you have to share her with them? Steve is so totally and completely committed. We couldn't quite get over his devotion, uh, ultimately, to Koresh. The realization that that is the level of absolute control that David had over all of those people was a real eye-opener. The 40th day of the siege at David Koresh's compound is ending just like the other 39, with Koresh and his followers on the inside, federal agents outside, waiting for something to happen. As the siege went on, uh, anything over time loses its intensity. Well, people would go out there and almost a tourist attraction. And my little girl wanted to see it. It became a kind of gag you'd hear on late night TV. Lisa! Wife number 12, also her age. No age minimum for the King of Kings. All the while, the tension was building, the misunderstanding between the federal government and, and the Branch Davidians. We are going through a very frustrating and disappointing period in the negotiation process. They agreed to let Koresh's attorney go inside. It's unprecedented that you would let a defense attorney go into a crime scene. Let me just say this one when the lawyers came out, they presented that Koresh would surrender after he wrote down his interpretation of the seven seals. You know, that's probably another lie. He was just playing games, playing for time. He had no intention of coming out. We are not going to be jerked around. At some point, it appeared that you had to take some type of action. What other options do you have? Wait them out, throw a fence around it, and call it the Federal Correctional Institute at Mount Carmel? I know one thing was talked about. 
Should we kill David Koresh? Or force him out. And the way you do that is through the introduction of a non-lethal chemical agent, namely CS tear gas. 51 days had passed. We hadn't had a person out in over a month. We haven't had a child out since the 5th of March. Enough's enough. How do you chase what you love with moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis? Do what I did. Ask your doctor about Humira. It's proven to help relieve pain and protect joints from further irreversible damage in many adults. Restore. When I found out that the truth was finally going to come out. Truth and Lies, the Tanya Harding story. Why? Have you ever apologized to Nancy? Enough apologizing. Next Thursday at 9, 8 central on ABC. We continue now with Truth and Lies, Waco. Nothing about April 19th started normal. Nothing. It was windy. The winds were blowing about 30, 35 miles an hour. It's very strong. That wind comes from a 1,000 miles away, and nothing stops it. That morning, we thought we were just going to have our regular routine, except this time, when I looked through the binoculars, I saw a tank with an extended arm, and then we realized they were going in. This is not an assault. Do not fire your weapons. If you fire, fire will be returned. I got on the loudspeaker and stressing that, David, you can stop this at any time. David, it is time to submit and surrender to the proper authority. Over the loudspeakers, he said, we will began to put gas into the building. This gas will temporarily render the building uninhabitable. The strategy is to make things so uncomfortable for Koreshina's followers that they will come out with their hands up. This standoff, David, is open. The tank came in through the front doors, the two double doors, and it just blew everything back. It was amazing to see a tank come through your living room. Exit the compound now, and no one will be injured. So someone started to run up and down the hall, waking everyone up and telling them to get their gas masks. Everybody grab your mask. Everybody grab your mask. There were no gas masks for the children, so the parents were soaking towels in buckets of water. If you had your gas mask on, you were fine. But if you took it off, even for a second, it would burn your eyes. Exit the compound now. So hour after hour, horrifying scene unfolded with the tanks tearing apart and pouring gas. And then it seemed suddenly. That place is on fire. The place was engulfed in flames. It started uh, just a few minutes ago. As you can see in this 40 mile an hour wind, uh, it seems to be uh, spreading quite rapidly. The fire originated in three different locations simultaneously. I didn't see the fire start, didn't see where it started or who lit it or didn't light it. We didn't understand, was this an accident with the Davidians killing themselves? I'm persuaded by the recordings of, of what was being said inside Mount Carmel that David Koresh and his most loyal followers decided to set the fire. I believe that David Koresh started the fire. The building was being destroyed slowly. I think the Koresh saw that. Oh, okay, now the building's on fire, so I'm in control. The lookout tower is uh, engulfed in flames. David had told the mothers to take all the children into the vault, which was the bottom part of the four-story tower. We had a bunker that everyone goes into, all the women and the children, in the event that the end of the world were coming. The interior staircases did collapse, and so the people that were on the second floors were trapped. They couldn't get out. From the very beginning, David Koresh has made it very clear that he was prepared to die. The wall started to catch fire. And I felt this tremendous heat up above the ceiling, over my head. I could hear my hair crackle. 
And when the hair starts crackling, that's a huge wake-up call. This 40-mile-an-hour wind is, is just whipping it uh, way beyond control. It's a burning fireball on the top of this building. As the flame started growing in intensity, I made a statement to David. I said, David, don't end it this way. You claim to be the prophet. You claim to be the Messiah. The time is to lead your people out. There are 95 people inside. Of them, 17 below the age of 10. A total of 25 below the age of 18. Why didn't they come out? You know, there were kids in there. And you're going, I don't understand this. For 51 days now, they've been adamant about saving the children inside of there, and uh, this is just a horrible, horrible sight here. I could hear some of the ones that were further back into the building behind me screaming. It sort of galvanized me. I jumped up and headed for the hall and ended up jumping outside. My thought on exiting the building was I'd rather be shot than to burn. I looked back over my shoulder, and the hall was a mass of flames. I thought, nobody's getting out of there now. The thing that really made my heart stop was when there's this huge explosion on the second floor. Honestly, for all the media that was there, I think we were all dumbfounded. We knew that this was the end for them. Flames, as you can see, just pouring out. And I think those of us who have watched this certainly did not expect this. I wish I could give you more information on the survivors. Emotionally, I was numb. I was quite literally in shock. At the very end, David Koresh had a bullet wound right in his forehead, which came from a rifle where he died next to Steve Snyder. Many of the people died of gunshot wounds, some self-inflicted, some inflicted by others. Only nine people survived the day of the fire. 78 people would perish that last day, and not a one of them had to. We were not successful in getting those children out, and boy, that was a, a traumatic thing. We knew that everything that we had done had been totally futile. Those people inside didn't have a choice because of their beliefs and their allegiance to one man. And God says his word is what I will be. You were born to travel. New Kimmel, tonight on ABC. We continue with truth and lies, Waco. This is kind of my homemade museum about Waco. I want people to be able to see what really happened 25 years ago. When I think of Waco, I think of murder and cover up. There's so many unanswered questions. Whether you liked David Koresh or hated him, it didn't matter because this was an armed group of U.S. paramilitary forces attacking U.S. citizens. I'm mad that they did this in our name. They did this in your name. They murdered those people at Waco in our name. Waco's a touchstone. It means something about the potential threat that government represents to ordinary Americans. Waco, you could argue, was a catalyst because you had these people marinating in their belief that the government was the bad guy. There are still many more questions than answers. Suicide or murder. What do you think happened? Government officials blame David Koresh for the deaths of 86 cult members. But some of those who fled the fire say the federal tanks set the compound ablaze. The congressional investigations heard a ton of testimony, and people go back to it today. It's all online. They want to hear the facts from the, from the people who know them. What, in your mind, was the consequences of waiting them out? It's not believable to say that the reason you went in was because of the children. Did you have any warning that they were going to burn the place down? Didn't you consider that fire might well occur? What the investigations did was simply demonstrate uh, that we could not even agree on the truth of Waco after it happened. Were you aware that the gas mask couldn't be used by the children and infants? There was no doubt in your mind that those fires were set by anyone other than the Davidians. What went wrong with ATF? What went wrong with FBI? We have been confronted with a very serious question of cover-up. There's this intense scrutiny, public opinion, all this, all this is bearing down on you. The Department of Justice put a gag order on us. We could not respond. The more we don't talk, 
the more wild theories come in. So by not talking about it, you're just letting them run with whatever they want to believe. The world still doesn't know the whole story. Here's where it gets crazy. So many conspiracy theories have formed out of Waco. It was a government conspiracy to get the Branch Davidian. It was Clinton himself, not Attorney General Janet Reno, who was calling the shots during the botched invasion. For people who are on the hard, far, anti-government right, Waco is the parable that the government is out to get. There's a common thread in all of this. They always destroy the evidence. What do they have to hide? But here's this extreme anti-government conspiracy theorist. You need to call for indictment to Janet Reno. Who has his roots in Waco. It shows this isn't history. It's not the dead past. It's a living thing in American politics today. Why do you allow yourselves to be manipulated? The images we saw in Waco in that 50-plus day siege were so authoritarian that I think it began to awaken some of the more revolutionary feelings I had. Timothy McVeigh was there and was so affected by the incident at Waco that he became an anarchist. He comes there on a pilgrimage and something goes off in him. It begins to crystallize this murderous anti-government vision that he has that it ends up in, in Oklahoma City. The federal building in Oklahoma City was rocked this morning by what some are speculating was a car bomb. The attack may have been revenge for the federal raid in Waco, Texas. Had we been allowed to be more candid, out front, responsive and honest with the American public, I don't think that bomb would have ever been set or detonated at Oklahoma City. The most unfair criticism is, is that the FBI killed these people. You always have to remember, the man behind that curtain was David Koresh. He chose that day to put kerosene or flammable around the compound and light a fire, and he chose to take others in his own life. That is David Koresh. This place will always be a battlefield museum. We're going to rebuild you a nice, beautiful church out here. We had people from 43 states and two foreign countries come to help. Uh, people are going to be coming out here probably forever uh, wanting to understand what happened here. We rebuilt the church is for a memorial to the people that died, and we did it because we wanted to kind of say mm, to the government, don't ever do it again or we will rebuild. Episodes start Monday, 10, 9 central on ABC. There are Branch Davidians still uh, living and worshiping in America. We all agree, no matter what side we're on, that the children of God are getting ready to face a very difficult time in this world. We were willing to die whatever way we had to die if it meant standing for God. Sometimes we have to be tested. We should have had a greater faith in God. God's will was that they died. He allowed it to happen. I think the devil was at work too, but God allowed that to happen, so I have to accept that. David Koresh was an individual who truly believed he had a mission from God, and he died for it. The memorial in Waco I have been to several times. It just brings back this senseless, useless feeling that this didn't have to happen. Just never forget February 28th, 1993. That's who we are. It shaped us. We lost four good men. Ultimately, I would say we never had control over how it was going to end. That was David. He made that decision. I don't think people really understand how evil he was. He led his people into death, and how sometimes, no matter your best efforts, you're not going to beat them. You're not going to beat them. There was a lot of mistakes made from both sides, and I'm not angry enough to point my finger at either side and say, you know, how could you do that? Just give us the truth. Won't the truth set you free? I think we can handle it. It's not going to bring back my parents. It's not going to bring back all these people who lost their lives. If I could speak to David Koresh, I think I would just ask him why. 
why would you want to kill this many people to, to make a point? What happened in your life to make you think this way? You know, help me understand. I can only believe that God was working through him. That's my hope. If I didn't believe that David was right, I couldn't handle this situation. I know that David was the real thing. One way or another, he believed it. He believed that he had was given something. And he made other people believe it because he believed it so well. I'm reminded of a verse directly from the Son of God himself, Jesus, who said, beware of false prophets. They come to you like lambs, but they're as ferocious as wolves. I miss my son. I mean, I'm gonna see him again someday. David Crush is coming back with God's army. And if I'm at the right place at the right time, I'll be gathered up with him. You're going to see whether you believe this message. I'm ready to be delivered. I'm ready to go to the portals of darkness and death. And you're not. Let's see if you believe the message after so many years. Years. Monday, Ari's already on the ride of his life. I have an amazing group of women. The girls are already driving each other crazy. Take some time and reflect on what you just did, because there's a lot of angry people here, and I'm just the voice. The Bachelor, all new ABC Monday. Snow from the Beltway.